Hey there, we are so thankful that you have made the choice to watch one of ACC's messages online. You know, as you are watching and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at your phone or your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. But you know, we say you belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means we would love to have you join us during one, our, one of our Sunday services at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. So we would love to have you jump into this message and we're believing God is gonna do some awesome things in your life today. morning. How are you guys doing this morning? Summer's coming to an end. School's about to start back up. I know. Just getting all those emotions out right now. Let it all out. It's a safe place. All right. Hey, my name is Chris. I get to serve as the youth and young adult pastor here at ACC. I'm excited you're here. I'm excited I get to spend some time with you this morning. And uh, we're going to open up God's Word in just a minute. I want to let you know if you're a guest with us this morning, if this maybe is your first time or you're not here all the time or uh, you don't know who I am, and uh, this is all weird to you. Um, that's okay. If you're a guest in somebody's house and they do something weird, you often ask the question, why do they do that? Uh, so I often don't wear shoes when I teach, which is weird to people. So I want to make sure you understand why I do that. Uh, there are a couple uh, instances in the Old Testament with Joshua and uh, with uh, Moses in the book of Exodus and the book of Joshua where they have an encounter with God. And when they have that encounter, God looks at them and he tells them to take off their shoes because the ground on which they were standing on is holy ground. Now, the, the soil didn't change, right? The mountains didn't change what they were standing on. So what did? The only thing that changed was that the presence of God was there. And I believe that when I stand on the stage, when we're sitting in this room, that the presence of God is here. And so for me, out of a sign of worship and respect to him, um, I remove my sandals as well. And so I just want that to be super clear with you guys up front as to why uh, that is the way it is. I'm not asking you to take your shoes off. For some of you, please keep them on, right, for the sake of the people around you. <clears throat> we've been going through this series called A Little Bit of Wisdom uh, Goes a Long Way, right? And we've been talking about how a different, different wisdom that comes out of the book of Proverbs. And we centered it all kind of around this theme verse in Proverbs 4, 7, right? It says, getting wisdom is the wisest thing that you can do. And whatever else you do, develop good judgment. We've talked about the difference between uh, knowledge and and wisdom, that knowledge is kind of having information, whereas wisdom is the actual application. Uh, we went up to Dorney Park yesterday, took my son uh, to go ride his first ever roller coaster, which was fantastic. He loved roller coasters, and it was a big win for us as a family. Uh, but he knew about them, but didn't understand the principle of buckling in and you know, locking himself down and going. There's difference between knowing the information and applying that information to your life, and we believe the same is true here, we've been taking the wisdom that we've been learning and saying, I don't want you to walk out with a, a bunch of cute notes and a nice little notebook uh, and not actually understand how to apply what we're teaching, not actually allow it to change our lives. Change happens in many forms. One of the ways that our lives change is often through news that we're given, be it good or bad. But specifically, good news often changes our lives drastically. But if you turn on the TV today, all you kind of see is awful news. And so I want to show you guys a clip. There's a guy by the name of Jimmy Fallon. He's a late night comedian who does this great bit that maybe will set the tone for what we're going to talk about today. Check this out. Read stories that we wish were true. Stories that make us feel good. <laughs> I'll show you what I mean in tonight's installment of I've Got Good News and Good News. Here we go. <laughs> This just in, your friends got together and agreed you need to post more pictures of yourself on social media. In sports, the Orlando Magic have decided to change their name to the Orlando U. Well, because you're magical. Breaking news, that crying baby on your cross-country flight just stopped, looked around and said, wow, that was pretty annoying. Sorry, everybody, 
and slept peacefully for the rest of the trip. <laughs> hey, remember earlier when you tripped and then you tried to play it cool by turning it into a little jog? Well, it worked. That's right, a few people saw it and totally thought you just decided to jog for a second. <laughs> just a reminder, ice cream. This just in, your favorite sports team can now hear your suggestions through the television, and they love the helpful advice. So, the next time you yell, how about playing some real defense? You can expect to see some real defense. I can't, I can't wait for that to happen this year. I'm super excited about that. So, we all love uh, good news, right? It changes. Think about the last time that you received good news. Maybe it was a, a sports team you made, or or an audition that you got the part that you wanted, or, or maybe it was something uh, like job related. You've been eyeing down this job forever and you finally got the job that you wanted, or, or you got a college application in that you finally got accepted to the school that you wanted, or you found out your best friend is getting married, or you found out you're pregnant, or, or whatever the good news is, somebody that you love is coming back from deployment. Those, that good news changes your life. It excites you. It changes everything about what's happening in your life. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning as well. We want to talk about the fact that God wired us up to, to find pleasure in that, to find pleasure in the good news in life, to find pleasure in living selflessly. A guy by the name of Stephen Post said it this way. He said, the way that God wired us releases several different happiness chemicals, including dopamine, endorphins that give people a sense of euphoria and oxytocin, which is associated with tranquility, serenity, or inner peace. He says, when giving selflessly, people say their friendships are deeper, they sleep better, and they're able to handle life's obstacles better. On a scale of 1 to 10, and 10 a really powerful drug like insulin in the treatment of diabetes, this stuff is there are probably around a 7 or an 8. And the amazing thing is, you don't even need to go to a drugstore for it. This idea of living a generous life creates within us a drug so powerful that it should be able to be bottled up and sold. Obviously, it's not. I think that'd be great, though. But the, the point of the reason, that why, the way that God wired us the way that he did was so that we wouldn't, we wouldn't need that. If we're living life correctly, then those are going to be what naturally kind of come into our lives. It's fantastic. So I look at our opportunity today, and that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about living a generous life. Now, before you squeeze your wallets too tight, that's not the point, all right? It's not the point of today. I want us to understand what living a generous life actually looks like. There's a passage in Proverbs 11 that I want us to look at. So if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to flip there with me this morning. Proverbs chapter 11, we're going to look at a couple of verses, and I want to give us some really clear application for our lives. What does that mean for us now? Proverbs 11, verse 24. It'll be on the screen if you, uh, if you don't have it in front of you. It says, give freely and become more, become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. This idea, this giving freely and becoming more wealthy. Wealthy here is not like if you give more, you're going to get more. I'm not up here saying, if you give me $100 today, I'm going to give you anointed oil or a plane, right? What I'm saying is giving freely allows you to build influence with people. It allows you to have true joy. It allows you, and this is a key one, a lot of us don't feel this, it allows us to feel satisfied in our lives, to feel a sense of accomplishment. When he's saying that when you give freely, you become wealthy, he's saying that your life will come to a point of satisfaction that you've never experienced before. On the other side of it, he says if you're stingy, in essence, you've received your reward. You got what you came for. And so for us, this contrast if I was going to think about it uh, differently, a generous person lives out of what they have and sees it as an opportunity to give more. A stingy person looks at what they have and wishes they had more. Do you see the difference? So the question we have to answer is, is where does true generosity come from? See, that the generous, and look at even verse 25, right? The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. This is really, if you think about the New Testament, Jesus comes out and he says this, he says, do to other people what you would have them do to you, right? This is the whole principle. Live a generous life and people will live generous lives back towards you. People respond to selfless living. People want to be around those people. I want to be around those people, right? So how do we find true generosity? 
I would say this, that generosity grows out of the gospel. Generosity, true generosity, grows out of the gospel. Now, if you're new to church or you're new to faith and you don't know what anything on that screen means, that's why we're here this morning. When you walk out of the room this morning, you're going to have a really clear idea of what it means to live a truly generous life. So the gospel, if you were to take that word at its very root, the easy definition is just good news. That's it. So generosity grows out of the good news that you've heard. So what is the good news you've heard? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8 9, he says that you know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he can make you rich. Now again, we're not talking about money, right? We're not saying become a Christian because we're all rich. As you'll find out later in the sermon, that's not true, right? He's saying the richness that you'll have is that satisfi- the satisfaction in your life. You'll feel a sense of joy in your life, true joy. So what does this mean? This is a really intense verse. It's simple, right? In the beginning, God created us for a relationship with him. Not because he needed to, but he selflessly created me and you in his image to look like him, to act like him, to walk like him, to talk like him. But at a certain point in the story, Adam and Eve decided it was better for them to worship themselves to try to become like God rather than living alongside of him. And so the separation between us and God began. There was sin entered the world and brokenness entered the world and created a chasm, a a break between us and God. And in that, God then began to reveal what's called the law. These are 613 plus rules and regulations that he expected his people to follow. Not because perfection got you to Jesus, but because he recognized that none of you could do it. None of them could do it. I couldn't do it. So why would he create a standard that you are unable to meet? Because he wanted to remind us of something really important. He wanted to remind us that we weren't God. And that we could never become him. But something really pivotal happened. He became us. Jesus comes to earth, God becoming flesh, lives, dies, and raises from the dead. And in that is what we call the gospel, the good news. The fact that God became flesh and lived a life we couldn't live, perfectly executing the law, died a death intended for you and me, and rose again. It is out of this that our generosity is intended to be lived. It is a reflection of what God has already done for me and for you. And so, we see here in the text, he's telling us not just that, right? But throughout the whole scripture, we see this idea of generosity becoming more and more prevalent. There are a lot of words in the Bible, if you were to read the whole thing cover to cover, but there are certain words that are important for us to know. Words that are repeated are often the most important words that we can ever learn in scripture. The first thing you're taught in in school when you're learning how to preach is that you look for things that repeat themselves over and over and over again. That's the theme of whatever that author is trying to write. So there are some words in the Bible that are important. Uh, There are words like believe. You would see this 272 times in the Bible. We tell you that all the time, right? Believe in who Jesus is. Believe, believe, believe. It's great. There's other words like pray. We tell you guys often, pray. It's important, right? 371 times you'd see the word pray read the Bible cover to cover. Or the word love. We all love that word love, right? It's a really trendy word right now. Love everybody, love, I get it. That's great. I love love. It's fantastic. 714 times. But more than all of those combined is the word give. 2,161 times. 2,161 times. It's a word that's talked about more frequently than anything else in Scripture. So it's clearly important, right? If it's repeated, it's important. So that's why generosity matters. It doesn't matter because I want to stand up here and talk to you about generosity. It matters because God saw fit to repeat it so many times that he knew that we would want to avoid it. And if we're honest, most church pastors do. They don't like talking about it because everybody gets a little awkward in the room. It's a little awkward in the room right now. It's fine. I love it. Let's live in it for a minute, all right? 
But this is what set the New Testament church apart from everybody else. This is what made the Romans and Greeks want to know what was different about them. Because the New Testament church wasn't known for their theology. They weren't known for their picket signs and their protests. They weren't known for how, how awful everybody else in the world was and how they were against them. They were known for their selfless serving of everybody else. They were known for their love of everybody else. That set them apart. That made them special and unique. See, their focus wasn't on themselves. And church, if our focus becomes on us, then we've missed the whole purpose of what God has called us to be. When our church focuses externally, which I feel like ACC does a fantastic job on the whole of focusing externally, people want to be a part of that because that is special. Have you ever walked into a restaurant? This is such a great uh, opportunity. You walk into a restaurant you walk up, you order your, your food, or maybe it's a coffee shop, and you order your coffee, you're going through the drive through you get to the window, you have your wallet out, you have your credit card out, and somebody says, it's already been paid for. Guy, guy in front of you took it, and you go, what? Yes, best day ever, right? Like, you walk out of that going, my day is now 1,000 times better than I just pocketed $5 or $10, depending on how uh, fruit fruit of a coffee you drink, right? Like, you just pocketed some extra dough, or you can make a second option, right, and pay for the person behind you, right? So this, this happened in Florida, 2014, 468 people, or 458 people, went through a drive through at Starbucks, paying for the person behind them, all the way through. 11 hours later, person 459 stopped it. I don't know, it's a weird interview, you can go read it. God's like, I just didn't want to pay for the guy behind me. I'm like, oh, all right, right, whatever. In, in uh, Indiana, 2017, 167 people in a, and I'm, I'm telling you, this is going to blow your mind, in a McDonald's drive through of all places, did the same thing. Paid for the person behind them. 167, like this is an incredible, simple, easy way to live generously, to care for people around you. People want to be around those people. And so the question is, for us, what does it look like to live generous? Mother Teresa said, a life not lived for others is simply not a life. A life not lived for others is simply not a life. So what does it look like to live generously? I told you I was going to be super applicable today. I want you guys to walk out with really tangible things in your hands of what to do next. How do we live a generous life? First and foremost, I would say if you're going to live a generous life, you have to love Jesus. Amen. You have to love Jesus. He is the reflection of generosity that we are intended to reflect. Like, it's not like I want to be like my dad or who is super generous I want to be like my cousin who's super generous. I want to be like my friend who's super generous. Like, I want to be like Jesus who's super generous. How do we know he was more generous than you? Because ain't nobody giving up their life for you so that you could have eternal life with him. Right? You checking with me? So, I, listen, that's great. I'm sure all of your friends and coworkers and parents were super generous people that you're looking up to. But Jesus is the ultimate person to look to. There's this guy in the New Testament, in the, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that tells the story of this this young, rich, powerful ruler who comes up to Jesus. And you can imagine, like, in this moment, the disciples come up and they're kind of nudging Jesus like, yo, don't screw this up. Like, this guy's got money. He could bankroll us for days. You know what I'm saying? So, like, don't mess it up. Like, give this, whatever he says, you just tell him whatever he needs to in order to get him in the fold, right? This isn't in the text. I'm just assuming because they're stupid and this is what they would do, right? So, <clears throat> so this guy walks up and he says, Jesus, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus looks at me and goes, ah, oh, it's easy. Like, don't murder, you know, don't steal, don't lie, don't covet, honor your mom and dad. The guy's like, aha, nailed it. I've done all that stuff since I was a kid. He's like, awesome. Oh, <laughs> sorry, forgot one last thing. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. And the text says that the guy walked away sad because he had a lot of stuff. Now look, Jesus wasn't going after his stuff. Right? My, the end of the message is not sell all your stuff and give it to the church. Jesus was exposing something in that man that's exposed in each one of us as well. And that is our love of self. Our worship of self. Jesus was calling this man to say, I'm not going to worship what I know I can do, my power, my money, 
my everything else and worship you. No, no, I'm going to worship me. Jesus is saying, no, no, release all of that and come and follow me. And I will make you more rich than you have ever imagined. Because here's, look, can I just share something really sweet with you guys about this guy? The only reason that a guy who is young, rich, and powerful would come and try to find something else in his life is because he's not satisfied. He couldn't find any satisfaction in all of his money and power and stuff. And Jesus is going, I've got your answer. Sell it all. And come follow me. So the guy walks away. Guys, this is part one of how do we live a generous life. We love Jesus well. Which means forsaking ourselves at certain points. How else do we live a generous life? We give greatly. This is kind of a hard one, so buckle in. We're going to have a little bit of fun. We give greatly. What does that mean, greatly? I'm glad you asked. Maybe for you this morning, it means starting off by just starting to give it all. Maybe you're going to walk out today and swap your credit card for $5. Like, I'm going to just start somewhere. I'm not going to go out to lunch, and whatever money I would spend at lunch, not like the fake money you would spend at lunch, I would only spend that later. If you're going to spend $100 at lunch, then give $100 and go somewhere else, right? Go home and eat a sandwich. It's fine. <laughs> God. Salmon, yeah. Oh, y'all, y'all call them sandwiches? Yeah. So many syllables. <laughs> See, here's the deal. God, God will grow you in ways when you give. God will grow you in ways that he cannot grow you apart from giving. God will only grow you in certain ways if you give. Why? Because there's a certain sense of trust and reliance and, and a belief in his faithfulness that only comes when your bank account could hit zero the next day. Look, I'm, I'm going to be super transparent with you guys. And, and if, if this gets me in trouble, like, Mac, I know you're watching online. I'm super sorry in advance. But here's, here's the bottom line. I love being generous. Love it. I love taking people out to eat. I love buying gifts for people because my love language is gifts. So I like getting gifts too. Just, just throwing that out there. All right? right? I love hosting a party. I love all, like I would spend money for days to make everybody else happy. But I hate tithing. Oh, but you're a pastor. You're not supposed to say stuff like that. It's all right. I'm a real person too. I don't know if you guys know that or not. Look, I get, a, I get an email every Sunday that says, your tithe has come out. And I go, oh! <laughs> look, I'm just going to be straight up with you guys about it. Why? Because I look at that money. I want you to hear what I say really quickly. I look at that money coming out, and I go, but I could, y'all know where I'm going with this, I could pay off this bill. I could do this. I could buy this. I could have this. As though God's not looking at my giving and going, I got more than that coming your way you don't even know about. And maybe it's not even financially. I got time you get to spend with your son because you're not going out to eat. You get to sit at home now and truly bond with your family. Whereas you go out to eat, you're like, here's an iPhone, stop bothering me. Y'all know, like, know what I'm talking about. Come on, don't. Like maybe God has you in a season of drought right now because he needs you to learn people, not money. You check it with me? Like maybe, just maybe, the reason why things are a little tight is because God's trying to teach you discipline. So you're that you're not a disaster. And so I look at it and I go, man, that's, that's not, it's not any easier for me to give than it is for you. My wife's a teacher, I'm a pastor. We've kind of reached like the level of money that we're ever going to get. Like we don't go much higher. We don't get the climb to the CEO level. Like where we're at is where we're at. So we had to learn to trust God and be faithful even in the little things of that. But man, we are so rich. I don't know if you guys know that. Maybe you don't think so. But I'd love for you, not right now because I'm, I'm preaching, but I'd love for you guys after service today to go to globalrichlist.com. Check this out. You can go to this thing called globalrichlist.com. And what it is, is a website. You put in how much money you as a household make per year. So say you make $50,000 combined uh, together. Fantastic. Put that in there. And guess what? It'll pop out a result. And this is what it'll say. Boom. You're in the top 31% of the world. If you make $50,000, just $50,000 combined household, you're in the top 31% of the world. Now, I don't know if you guys can see this or not, but it says that makes you 
the 18,652,583 person. I don't know if you guys know this. There are 8 billion, with a B, people in the world. And you are 18 million if you make $50,000. But I'm so poor. I get it. But you're not. Most of the world, 80% or 80% of the world lives on $10 or less a day. You probably spent $10 on breakfast this morning. You sure with me? If you make $100,000 combined family income, you're in the top 8% of the world. 8%. What? Guys, we're so rich. We don't see it, right? We don't see it because we only see us. Because we're not living through the lens of gospel. Living through the lens of us. And, and since Renee and I have started giving faithfully, even on the weeks where it hurts, even on the weeks where we're having to move money over from savings just to make it, even on the weeks where, where it is looking at each other and going, are you sure this week? Like, are we going to be able to get that bill taken care of this week? Even on those weeks, our family has never starved. God has always been faithful. There's always, and there's story after story, and people who give will happily share story after story of how God has been faithful, even on the weeks where it's been challenging. There's a, a tangible way you can do this this morning. I want to be super clear because I don't think I was super clear last service. So there's an opportunity for you. So, so we have about 800 adults that come on a weekend in, in this building between our three services. Here's what's really neat. Right now, I'm sure you guys, uh, sure you guys have heard. If not, then you, this will be new news for you. Uh, but we're a little bit behind on the budget. Not much, not to the point where we're like shutting off lights and stuff. But we're just, we're behind. It just is what it is. Like we're behind. Summer's always tough. It just is what it is. But here's a really neat fact. If you guys want to know something cool that you can do tangibly, you're like, hey, how can I start giving today? I don't give at all. Or maybe I've kind of plateaued in my, in my giving. If each person that came through on a Sunday morning, each adult, went out and gave $50 today, above whatever you'd give on a normal week. If it's zero, $50 total. If it's $100, you give $150. If everybody gave $50 more, then we'd be closer to the black than we've been all year. Just like that. 50, 50 bucks. You probably spend that at Mission Barbecue at lunch today. And if not, what, where have you been going to lunch? You know what I mean? <laughs> how, how simple is that? Each person in the room goes out and says, 50 bucks, that's easy. I give 50 bucks today. I go, I'm not talking about next week. I'm not talking about next year. I'm talking about today. You walk out today, you sweat 50 bucks. Boom, done. Maybe paydays on Wednesday. Wednesday night, boom, 50 bucks. Why? Because you have the opportunity to give to something greater than yourself. Guys, I'm not asking you to give me 50 bucks so I can get a plane. I'm not asking you to give me 50 bucks so I can send you something weird in the mail. Right? I'm saying that you have the opportunity to change lives in the giving in this church. Look, some of you could probably walk in the door right now, write a check for $50,000 and be bored with it. You know what I mean? Like walk in and be like, 50 grand? All right, whatever. Cool. Here you go. And I'm, I will, that's great. Do that. Okay? We need you too. <laughs> yeah, come on. Bring that in. But don't think that that person's just here to bail everybody else out. That person's giving in conviction of what God has called them to do. But God has called you to give as well. Start somewhere. Whether that's $5 for you today, $50 for you today, $5,000, whatever it is, I want you to truly think about what God is calling you to do today. Where do you start? You got to start somewhere. And so, we give greatly. Here's another way that we can live a generous life, is we volunteer faithfully. Man, we have some great volunteers in this church. Probably some of the best that I've ever worked with. Uh, and I, um, I only really deal with really one department, right? Our, our student ministry, I don't jokingly, I seriously say that we have the greatest team in the church. Hands down, I don't care who you are, I don't care what team you lead, you're wrong. Remix is the greatest volunteer team that is in this church. And all I know is this, that we have a lot of volunteers that come in and go, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to talk to students. I don't know what to say. If somebody says something hard, and I don't know the answer to it. doesn't matter. Guess what? Come and serve. You know the number one response I get from people who serve? They come back to me and they say, I think I got more out of that than they did. You have the opportunity to grow in ways you could never grow if you didn't serve. If you didn't serve. You see, you living out of a job, man, this is a really important piece of the, if you listen to nothing else, hear this. You living out of a generous life is the difference between somebody hearing about Jesus and somebody not. Let me say that again. You living out of a generous life 
is the difference between somebody hearing about Jesus and somebody not. If you're not awake yet. You living out of a generous life is the difference between somebody going to heaven and somebody going to hell. That is, maybe you never thought about it that way. Maybe you've never thought about the fact that you matter. Maybe you never thought about the fact that you loving Jesus changes the world. Maybe you never thought about the fact that you giving money changes the world. Maybe you never thought about the fact that you serving faithfully changes the world. But hear me on this. Your opportunity to live out of a generous life changes people's lives for all of eternity. And you have an opportunity today to do that, to go to the blue wall and say, Cynthia, I don't care where you put me, but I got to serve because I know God's not going to grow me unless I serve. Hey, I don't know how much money you need, but I got a blank check. What do you want? I will do it today. Hey, I don't know what I need to do, but I know that I need to love Jesus first and foremost, and I got to start there. So today is the day that you step up and you say, today is the day I'm not going to make any more excuses. I'm not going to say my time equals my tithe. Uh, I could not say anything that was all censored right there. That's garbage. Your time does not equal your tithe. Your time equals your time. That's great. I'm super happy. If you're worth money outside of these walls, fantastic. But inside of these walls, you're worth nothing except for what Jesus has given you. And you have the opportunity to serve, not feel like you're giving instead of giving. Does that make sense? So our opportunity to live our lives is to be leveraged to give and to live generously. Your lives, my life, needs to be leveraged in order to live and to give generously. There's a, a, a really uh, difficult story for, for us. In 2014, uh, we were living in South Carolina at the time in our house. Uh, well, I had left to go to work around 9.45, and I got a call at 10 o'clock from my neighbor, uh, and she had told me, hey, uh, your house is getting robbed right now. I'm watching it happen. And I drove home. I beat the cops there, and they had already left. Uh, and our house, I mean, walked in, our house was ravaged, stuff thrown everywhere, they'd taken everything that mattered, and uh, just an absolute horrible, if you never had that happen to you, it's one of the greatest violations of privacy, of intimacy, like knowing that people were rummaging through your things, it was a really hard thing for my wife and I to go through. And I just, I can tell you this, if there hadn't been people there who loved Jesus, who came and just put their arms around us, and loved us well in that difficult time. There, were, there wasn't people who generously gave so that we could get back to, to normalcy in our lives. I mean, my wife was pregnant with my daughter at the time. We had a three-year-old son. And, and them walking back in to, to this house, that's terrifying. We didn't have volunteers come in to help clean and, and fix the doors that had been busted and help repair all the things that had been broken. Like, those people lived out of the generosity of their lives. You and I have the opportunity to do the same thing. There's a guy in the book of Acts chapter 7, a guy by the name of Stephen. Stephen is, was an administrator by trade. He was recruited to come and to help serve the widows, give them food, but he also preached when he had the opportunity. And he was brought before the religious leaders of the day and was told, be quiet. And he's like, no, I can't because you need to know that everything that you believe is a lie. Everything you've thought was true is not. And that Jesus is real, and he's come and he's lived and he's died so that you could have true life. And at that, they ripped their clothes, they yelled, they screamed, and they brought him out, they threw him in a pit, and they began to stone him. If you don't know what that is, this idea of uh, basically somebody would be thrown probably into a pit or off a cliff somewhere, and then they would pick up these, I don't know, sizable rocks and hit your body, your head to the point where you dead. So Stephen, in the midst of being, having these stones thrown at him, does something revolutionary to me. He, he's being pelted by these stones, and he looks up, very reminiscent of Jesus on the cross. If you haven't read it before, it's, this is exactly almost word for word what Jesus says on the cross. But he looks up at Acts 7.59. He says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, which is exactly almost what Jesus said on the cross. And he fell to his knees, and, and check this out, this is so powerful, shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. What? I get caught up in traffic, and I want to hit the guy. You know, you all know what I'm talking about. I don't act like you're better than me, right? And this guy has these people standing over him, throwing rocks down at him. And his thought process is, 
Don't hold this against them. Father, forgive them. Even in his dying breath, Stephen lived a life of generosity that we almost pale in comparison to. But the only reason why he was able to live that life was because he lived it out of his understanding of the gospel. He lived it out of his understanding of the good news that he heard about Jesus. You and I have the chance to do the same thing this morning. If it's true that our generosity grows out of the gospel, then you and I have the chance this morning to make that same difference. Maybe for you this morning, it's, it's heading out and going to serve. Maybe for you this morning, it's saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to commit to that challenge. I'm going to go, I'm going to give 50 bucks. I'm going to give five bucks. I'm going to give, I'm going to give whatever. I'm going to write a, a blank. I'm going to do whatever it takes to see the ministry of this church change lives, feed families, and be a part of this community forever. I'm going to be a small part of making a difference today. That small part to play, your faithfulness is what God works through. God never wanted the rich. Remember, he rejected the rich. God wanted the faithful. He wanted the people who were going to be faithful and obedient to what he's calling them to do. So this morning, whatever God's calling you to do, whether that's heading out to the blue wall and saying, I need to serve, whether it's heading to the kiosk or going on the app or going on our website, or if you have a checkbook still, I don't know if those exist anymore, but if you have, like, whatever it is that you had to be, whatever it is for you to be faithful to God this morning, do it. And reap the benefits of seeing God grow you in ways that he cannot grow you apart from your faithfulness in these matters. Living a generous life is one of the most satisfying, not one of, it's the most satisfying life. And you will experience true joy, happiness, peace, satisfaction, the likes of which you've never seen before. The question is, church, will you respond or not? Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a staff and as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep down into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on a Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. As a reminder, Please remember, you belong at ACC.